All right, shall we open our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 1, verse 57. Luke was a Gentile doctor who came along a little bit later than the disciples did. He is kind of a second generation believer. He wasn't really on the scene when Jesus was here, but he was sent by the Lord to record as a doctor with kind of a you know statistical kind of mind the things that had been reported to the Lord and write them in an order that you know his friend who he wrote to this book in the book of Acts would find his faith being strengthened. And so we've talked about, you know, discipleship and how Luke spent years of effort, witness interviews, you know, compiling information just so his buddy could stand fast in his faith in Christ. And because of that, Luke's very thorough. Most, much of what we know about the Gospels we, we can find in the book of Luke. And he's very uh, thorough in the sense that he's, he, he goes slow forward. We, you know, we, we've been in chapter one for a while. We, we were told about his intentions there in the first four verses. We were told about Zacharias being visited by the angel in the temple and told that he was going to have a son named John. We, we, we were told about Mary's visit with the angel and, and that she was going to bear the Messiah. We, we were told of Mary's visit with Elizabeth, who was bearing John the Baptist and how all that went. And this morning we get to the birth of John the Baptist and uh, the prophecy of his dad and then Chapter 2, it's all about Jesus' birth and his early years. And then it isn't until chapter 3 that John goes to work and Jesus is revealed. So Luke's kind of, a, you know, he's laying the groundwork. He's very thorough for what he wants us to do and understand. And this morning, you might remember Zacharias in the, in the temple when he was told by the angel, you're going to have a son. They were both old and his wife was barren. And, and he was in doubt of whether how that could be, even though the angel was speaking to him there in the holy place. And so the sign that God had given to him through the angel was he wasn't going to be able to, allow to speak until his son was born, which will be today. Um, I think the lesson, maybe more than anything else, besides the information that you get, because the you know, narrative tends to give you lots of information, and you've got to kind of stand next to the characters in narrative books, like the Old Testament historical books, like the Gospels as well. The best way to learn is to go stand with the people you're reading about. You know, put yourself in their shoes. What were they learning? What were they seeing? How how did this go? Because the narrative is really the lesson. And certainly the lesson this morning is is twofold. One of them, it's a good thing to know that when God says something, you can count on it. And number two, if you can come to that conclusion in your own life, your Bible studies will change. And the way you will read God's word and the way you'll you'll carry it with you will, will, will change because now you you've read something that you believe is to be accomplished. And by the way, God will do what he wants no matter whether you believe him or not. You know, he's going to have his way no matter what. So if I believe him, I can enjoy being part of his plans. If not, like Zacharias these last nine months, you're going to kind of sit on the sidelines. God's still going to do what he wants, but you're not going to be involved with it very much. The good lesson this morning from Zachariah is those nine months were not wasted on him. He comes, a, a, he comes out a, a much better man for it. And I guess that's how growth works, right? God takes you through it so that you might learn to depend upon him. So we ended last week with verse 56, Mary staying with her cousin Elizabeth for those uh, many months, the uh, last three months of her pregnancy. We don't know if she stayed through the birth or not, but regardless, um, there's where she stayed. Verse 40, uh, sorry, 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And when her neighbors and her relatives heard how the Lord had shown her great mercy, they rejoiced with her. And so it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But his mother answered, she said, no, he'll be called John. And they said to her, well, there's no one in your relatives who is called by that name. And so they made signs to her, his father. What would you like to have him called? And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote down his name is John, and they all marveled. Verse 57, the time for her son to be delivered. God had said it would be a son. Again, count on God. <laughs> if he tells you something, you can count on it. Notice that the family and the relatives rejoiced in that work of God's grace. Um, by the way, in the culture, first century, you may not be happy to hear it, but you know they were agrarian cultures, so if you had a boy... There were great shouts of joy. 
everyone came over and the party lasted a long time. If you had a daughter, not so much. She was kind of seen as a liability and the party ended early. They took John, well, his name would be John, to be circumcised on the eighth day. The, the circumcision, I know you have understood hopefully by now, that God gave that to Israel as a sign, an outward sign of faith. That these people that he chose were to live by their spiritual convictions. That they weren't to live by their flesh like the world. They were to live by, guided by the Lord, guided by his word, led by his spirit. And so um, God gave the outward sign in the flesh of circumcision, the, the cutting away, if you will, of the flesh so that God's people would be led by him. They were to be spiritual minded. They were to be spiritually led. Yet like any outward ritual or rite, if you will, the minute that purpose for that ritual is lost in devotion, it becomes mechanical and it becomes worthless. And you can certainly find that in, in the Bible, that sometimes what turned out to be an outward action to to mirror and heart of, of, of love or commitment has now been reduced to kind of mechanical religious exercises. And you should know that was the, the case for most people in Jesus' day when it came to circumcision. It was something you did because of who you were, not because of who he was. And there isn't that connection made. Well, there is with this family, certainly. But there's usually not that connection made between the right and, and what it represented. So uh, much Jewish confidence in religious rites without faith were certainly a part of the landscape in, in the first century. When, when Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 2, he said, look, circumcision is, is profitable if you keep the law, or if you really if you're seeking God's heart. But the minute you're a lawbreaker and you really don't you know, care about what God has to say, that circumcision might as well be uncircumcision. And he went on and he says, you know, it isn't the physically circumcised that are right with God. It's those whose hearts are right with him. And then it isn't someone who's a Jew outwardly, but one who is a Jew inwardly by believing in the Lord and trusting in him. And then I think it's in the next chapter, maybe a second, no, chapter four, maybe of Romans. Paul says, and by the way, Abraham was counted right with God and a friend for God before he was circumcised. So that he could be an example that that's really what God's after, right? Your commitment to him, not the ritual. Ritual is fine because it represents truth, but it's worthless if, if the heart isn't right. And so Paul goes out of his way there in Romans chapter 4 to say, look, this is something that, that Abraham had in his heart before the Lord ever brought him to that rite of, of circumcision. Certainly for Zacharias and for Elizabeth bringing their son to the temple, this was an act of faith and obedience. Because everything we know about them, they had a tremendous relationship with God. And so, everyone came on the eighth day to the circumcision, the family and all. And, the, and notice the, the they <laughs> there said that they should name him Zacharias because that was his dad's name. And, and circumcision day, the dedication day was also the day of, of some putting his name on the official documents. And so, everyone said, well got to be Zacharias. And it was Mary, who, I mean, sorry, Elizabeth, who spoke up and said, no, 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 we're going to name him John, which, by the way, is what the angel, back in chapter 1, verse 13, had told her husband, when the boy's born, name him John. Well, the family didn't like that answer. By the way, the, the name uh, Zacharias means God remembers. And so they turned to Elizabeth. You know, what, what do you mean, John? You know, and, and like I said, very patriarchal society. And so she says, John means God is gracious. And they went, yeah, let's talk to her husband <laughs> because we're not liking the answer she's given us. And so not getting anywhere with her, verse 62, they turned to, to dad. I'm sure they expected him to appreciate the fact that everybody thought naming him after him would be good. And, and here's the deal. He's still not able to speak. If you were with us when we started. The angel said, you're not going to be able to speak. That will be your sign. No speaking until the, your son is born. He has been born over a week ago now. So I don't know if Zachariah's going, come on, man. Everything you said is true, except this part, you know. So I don't know how he was handling this very well, but they, they said to him, um, what do you say? 
and, and he answers, it is John. And he doesn't say he shall, shall be called John. He's very assertive. He's a, his name's John. It's a settled issue. Because again, back to verse 13 of this chapter, he's been told. Whether speaking or not, Zechariah over these last nine months had learned something about trusting God's word. And really that's what he, he got him in trouble to begin with, right? He, he was told God's word. He was sent an angel. He was given a wonderful promise. And he went, yeah, I need a sign. And that's unbelief is something that God wants to develop out of our lives. And, and certainly, I think over the last nine months, that's been going on in this, this young fa or older father's life. You know, that, goodness gracious, I should have trusted the Lord. Now I can't say a word. And it's been months on end. And, and doubt had given way to obedience. And, and this is the result. He just called his name John. And so we read in, um, as everyone marveled in verse 63, that he didn't want to be named after his, his own name. It says in verse 64, immediately when he made that assertion, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he was able to speak and he began to praise God. And fear fell upon all those who dwelt around them and all those sayings were discussed throughout all of the hill country of Judea and all those who heard them kept them in their hearts and said, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Zacharias, obeying the direction of the Lord through the angel Gabriel, now finds himself in a different position. When you receive God's word and act upon it, God is able to bless you again. Right? It had been, Zacharias, it had been so doubtful and so, and, and, and so hesitant. And if, you know, you're reading through the narrative, you go stand with Zacharias. He, you know, he'd struggled, but his wife was getting very pregnant every day. And, and he had to just face that day in and day out. And so what happens the minute he obeys the Lord's word and he acts upon what he has been told, God now can bless him again. And, and the sign has to can be removed and he's been brought to the place of trust. And so he begins to praise the Lord and, and sing his praises, if you will. And no, notice it left the people, at least around them, convinced that God was at work. And there was this healthy kind of fear that gripped their hearts. And they began to wonder, what kind of child would this be? And, and I don't doubt that already they were speculating, um, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe that began already there in the hills of Judea. We don't know. But we do and are told that God's hand was upon old J.B., easier than John the Baptist, we'll just call him J.B., <laughs> from the moment of his birth. Now, I don't know what happened 30 years later, because literally, John's going to disappear today until chapter 3, 30 years later. We really won't know anything at all about John for the next 30 years except this verse. God was with him. I don't know if the people in his family and those were able 30 years later to look back and where, remember... Remember this circumcision? Remember the day of dedication? And the things that happened then, or by then maybe the town had just simply forgot about this miracle and this miraculous birth and all these things that were happening as a result. Well, his father, Zacharias, verse uh, 67, was now filled with the Spirit and began to prophesy. Early on in the book of Luke, you're sort of getting a lot of people singing. Elizabeth sings. Mary sings, Zacharias sings. And you read this phrase, and you're going to see it a lot. You, you read it about Elizabeth. You'll read it now about her husband, Zacharias, filled with the Spirit. And, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, he can then begin to just <laughs> speak out the things that are in his heart that God wants to say. I thought about Zacharias this week and thought, you know, here's here's a worshiping priest who was fortunate enough to be ch chosen that day to, to go into the temple and serve and light the candles in the holy place and met with the angel and then had to sit for nine months and watch God's word come to pass. You know, it couldn't escape the obvious, right? Had to see his wife continue to kind of to grow more pregnant and, and he had to he had to sit without saying a word. He, he couldn't. And I, and I wondered if somewhere... Along the line, he didn't say to the Lord, sorry, <laughs> should have listened to you. You know, now I feel like a failure. Like, 
or maybe you're punishing me. And I wonder how many times he might have asked the Lord to restore his speech. I, I, I was wrong. I had such little faith. But I'll tell you what, what the Lord took him through to get to this place, his song here, his worship, his prophecy, showed that he had certainly gotten over this doubtfulness about God and had begun to live his life with a confidence in the Lord that God would have us to have as well. If Mary's song is called the Magnificent, uh, Magnificent, which comes in, comes from verse 46, the word magnify, Zacharias' song is often referred to as the Benedictus, another Latin word meaning to bless, verse 68. His prophecy, though, of the words that we're going to read here, focus much more upon Jesus than upon his own son. In fact, there's only going to be two verses in here which even mention John's ministry. But the rest has to do with God's promise of a Messiah. He'd been told by the angel, your son will be the forerunner of the the one we're all waiting for. And that's his focus. If Mary in her song of praise focused on God's character, in fact, if you go back and read it, she just talks about who he is. Zacharias focuses upon his work, what he has come to do and what he will yet do. And so here's the prophecy of a priest whose voice is returned to him because he now trusts the Lord and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 68, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Zechariah's faith is now overflowing. <laughs> Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has redeemed. And notice it's written in the past tense. Has he redeemed Israel yet? No. This is the first time in 400 years Israel has heard anything from God. But here's the thing. Zechariah's faith has been growing to the point where God would have yours to be, and that is this. If God says it, whether he's done it yet or, yet or not, doesn't matter. He, he will. And so oftentimes even the Lord speaks about what he is going to do in the, pa in the past tense, as if it's, it's already an accomplished fact. God will meet your needs. God, I hope he will. He will meet your needs. You could literally say, God has met my needs. Well, are your needs all met? No, but he will. Because he is a faithful God. And Zacharias has learned so well that the Lord is now the one that can meet his needs. All of a lesson that we have to learn. If God says it, there's no doubt about it. When Paul was on that ill-fated boat, boat trip on the way to Rome, and the Lord, you know, took this, this boat through a, a storm of, of unparalleled kind of danger, and the boat was about to just be destroyed. Paul had been held downstairs as a prisoner, but he asked to meet with all of the people, and he, he stood up and he, he told them that the Lord had appeared to him, that God had shown them that they will, if you didn't jump ship and you'll just stick with the, a boat until the Lord says, oh, no one would die. We'll all be saved. It'll all be fine. And then Paul said there in Acts 27, you can take heart, men. I believe God is going to do just like God said. That's the faith God wants from us, right? That's the faith Zechariah needed to learn. And so he says that here, 400 years of silence, Israel now dominated by a foreign power, weary Jewish eyes looking for the Messiah, longing for God to move, and that hour has come, and Zechariah is now nine months later convinced of it. His boy would be the forerunner the Lord was come. So he writes in verse 68, he has visited, he has redeemed his people. God was going to visit man to redeem him. Jesus is God. The word, by the way, redeem means to, to buy back, right? To pay a price. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Same word for many. Zechariah had come to realize that they were on the brink of the saving work of God in sending his son, the Messiah. He was well aware of Mary's visit, well aware of his wife's response when Mary walked in, the prophecy, Mary's understanding. He had a lot to go on now. And he was taking it all in and responding to it as well. He writes in verse 69, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, 
David. The term horn in the scriptures always speaks of strength, usually a leader's strength. God is able to save us. God is able to deliver us from sin and from hell and from ourselves. He has come, as promised, to the house of David. Now, both John the Baptist's parents were from the tribe of Levi. He's not speaking about his son. He's speaking about the one that he would come before. He says in verse 70, And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all of those who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Promised by the mouth of the the prophets. I suspect that Zechariah had spent a long time these last nine months digging into the prophets. What did he say? What did they say about the Messiah? Was there any indication in their words, was in Malachi, of his own son's ministry, running before the Lord, preparing the way? I suspect that this helped him to establish, be established in the faith. The first assurance God ever gave to us about our redemption was his words to Adam and Eve. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, He'll bruise your head. He'll, you will bruise his head. He'll bruise his heel, head. You'll bruise his heel. So, as you read through the scriptures, God continued to develop this promise of a coming Savior. To Moses, Deuteronomy 18, I'm going to raise up a prophet that will arise like you. To David, I will give you one to sit on the throne at the right hand of the Father. The, the amazing prophecies to Isaiah that would one that would come would be Emmanuel, God with us, that he would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And then go read Isaiah 53, all of the suffering that the Messiah would suffer. And, and Zechariah is dug in. Notice what he, he writes here. By the mouth of your holy prophet, since the world began, you were telling us that you would deliver us from our enemies and from those who hate us, while performing the mercy that you promised to our fathers and remembering your holy covenant. Ezekiel spoke of the the shepherd that was to come. So did Zechariah the prophet. Daniel spoke of his rule and of his sacrifice and of his work. And I suspect that Zechariah took a lot of notes these last nine months. Right? He, He was pushed into a place where he had to kind of look at his own heart. He spoke verse nine, uh, uh, nine, uh, 70, sorry. He spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets. It's God's word. I've learned I can count on it even when I don't understand. It really is the lesson of these verses. Zacharias has come to believe that God means what he says. Notice he writes in verse 71 about the deliverance that the Messiah would bring to Israel from their enemies. Now, for the Jewish nation, their narrow view of deliverance was to overcome the Roman yoke. That was all they cared about. Get us out from under the oppression of the politics in which we find ourselves. In reality, God had a much greater deliverance in mind, deliverance from the real enemy of our life, from from the devil himself, from sin and from the flesh. I think Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, said, look, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers from the rulers of darkness and high places. Uh, That's our battle. And so Jesus took our sin and defeated our enemy at Calvary. It's a great verse in Colossians chapter 2 where it says, And you being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He's made alive together with him, having forgiven you your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that are against you, contrary to you, and has has taken them out of the way. He's nailed them to the cross. He's disarmed principalities and powers, and he's made a public display of them, and he's triumphed over them. That's exactly what God promised. The devil would lose. You would win. Your sins would be forgiven. Your name would be redeemed. He has come to perform, verse 72, the mercy that is promised to our God, to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant and the oath which he swore to our father 
Abraham. And I, I'll just point this out because it's it's not very evident in English, but I thought it was kind of interesting. And it was the first time I actually saw this reading and studying this week's. But there are three words there that reflect the name of the three people involved, which is interesting to me. Not sure if that's how he meant it, but the word mercy is the name for John. And the word remember is the name of Zacharias. And the word oath, God's promise is oath, is the name for Zach, uh, Elizabeth. So God has made a, <laughs> a promise. He's made an oath. We should remember his mercy. And as the Lord has made a covenant with Abraham years earlier, and that covenant in Genesis 12 was that, that the Lord would bless those who bless you. I'll make a great name for you. And, and all of the families of the earth would be blessed because of you. Years later. How many years later? Anyway, years later. Take me a minute to think it over through. In Genesis 22, so Abraham was 125 years old. God repeats that promise to him when he was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac. And by now, young Abraham has grown into a man of tremendous faith, even believing if he had to offer his son to the Lord who had no children. And God made this promise of having kids that God would have to raise him from the dead. But one thing for sure, God couldn't fail because God said so. And so God spoke to them in, in, him to, in Genesis 22, and, and he said, I'm going to bless you and multiply you and your descendants like the stars of the heaven, the sands of the sea, and your descendants will possess the gates of your enemies. In you, all of the nation of the world will be blessed because you obeyed my voice. And God made that promise again and again to Abraham that he could rely upon the Lord. God is always eager to encourage our faith. If you watch Abraham's progression, it started kind of, kind of slow. It didn't kind of come out of the land so quick, waited, diverted, got there finally. 75 years old, so I guess it would be 50 years between the first promise in Genesis 12 and the second one in 22. After all God had initiated with Abraham, it always starts with him. But with each passing day, at least for the people of, of John the Baptist's day, I think the people were losing hope. They hadn't heard from the Lord in centuries. The promise of a Messiah seemed to be you know, more isolated than ever. But I'll tell you, one guy who began to believe it again was Zacharias. Nine months of <laughs> can't speak, visit of an angel, the miracle that he was watching before his eyes. And he now opens his mouth and he says, you've made these promises through the prophets since the world began. You promised to deliver us from our enemies and, and to be gracious and to remember your covenant and the oath that you've made to Abraham. You've done everything you're going to, you've, you've said. And he just, He's at rest. He's at rest. He believes it now. So, hey, we're living in the last days. Churches run around going, Jesus is coming. You look around and go, where is he? Well, I don't know. But he's coming. And the way it looks these days, it seems to be shortly. I don't know if you know this, at least from a biblical standpoint, but there is no one Bible verse that needs to be fulfilled before the Lord can return. Nothing. There's nothing that you'd say, well, the Lord, you know, maybe after these things are taking place. No, everything is done. Everything that needed to be done is done, except for his coming. So now we live in a world like many in, in Zacharias's day that they scoff. You know, Second Peter writes about the scoffers in those days of the Lord's coming. Zacharias was no longer in their company. He might have joined them before, but now he was convinced of what God had promised. And, and he's got little John the Baptist in his arms, JB. But he is convinced now that Lord's promises is something that he can count on, which is when Paul wrote to, was it chapter 10 to the re Hebrews, and he said, Let's hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. He is faithful who promised. If you could leave here this morning just convinced that that Bible in your hand can be counted upon, you'll do fine. You really will. God can be counted upon. So often we, we speak of his, his, his return and we're not so eager about it because somehow it just kind of gets pushed to the, to the back of our minds. 
I, I know when I was a young Christian, that's all we talked about. Maybe today. Maybe today. And then you got tired of maybe today. Maybe this year. Maybe in my lifetime. Well, I don't know when he's coming, but I tell you what, Zacharias was ready. God had promised. He says as he goes on in verse 74, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all of the days of our life. This deliverance from our enemies is real. Imagine coming to the Lord and now being able to live your life without a fear and knowing that God is going to give you victory and make you holy. The word holy just means singularly, singularly devoted, if you will. His name is on your cup. You're his cup. And righteous, that which God accepts. Sometimes we hear from folks that they go, oh, we love the Lord. And then you look at their lifestyle and you go, really? Because a person that loves the Lord shouldn't live that way. But, you know, that's not my call. That's beyond me. I can't see their hearts. God sees the heart. But I do know this. When the Lord moves into your heart, he'll change you and, and enable you to serve him. And, and your life will be different than it was. Love me as I've loved you. Abide in my love. Don't grow weary in well-doing. In due season, you'll reap if you don't think. Just, he's coming. We're ready. We're looking for him. Truly, those that are saved from their enemies will serve the Lord and not look back. I, I remember those, those folks in John 6 when Peter and the boys, and there was a ton of people following Jesus, and they didn't like what he had to say. It just that, that They quit. Eh, I can't buy this, you know. And Jesus said to Peter, or, or to the disciples, y'all going to leave too? I don't know if he said y'all. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. In. Well, then anyway, are you leaving too? And it was Peter who said, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We're with you all the way from this day forward. In the Old Testament, serving the Lord could be provoked by fear. I mean, think about it. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies with a rope around his legs and bells around his waist because he was going into God's presence just once a year, shaking. Sometimes maybe his heart was wrong. He died. There's no more bells. you got to pull them out and send in the assistant high priest, I guess. No, not me. They watch the earth open up and eat the centers <laughs> of the Lord's ways. They watch people struck with leprosy. Some died suddenly. Oh, man, I'll get in line just to serve the Lord out of fear. But now, look, God's forgiveness through his son removes the anxious fear, and his love produces commitment. It's his love which draws us in. And so we read here that the Lord has delivered us so we could serve him without fear. Verse 76, and now we turn to John the Baptist. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the most highest, or of the highest, and you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sin. So Jesus is the preeminent one, but John... John's birth would have actually little significance above everyone else's were it not the fact that he was tied to this calling that God had given him and he, he's called a prophet of the Lord here. He's the last Old Testament prophet. He goes before the Lord to prepare his ways. Jesus is called here, by the way, the Lord. Notice, he goes before the Lord, so before the highest. Jesus is called the Lord. And John's message was pretty simple. Get ready, the Lord is coming. Gabriel had told Zacharias what his son's future would be. And notice, <laughs> Zacharias is all in now. He believes everything he hears. Verse 77 says, To give knowledge of salvation to his people, and that knowledge is that they will be saved through the forgiveness or through the remission of their sins. John had one message. Here's the message. Repent. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. John baptized people. It was a baptism of repentance. John literally did this. There's, there's a Savior coming, 
you have to be ready to meet him by acknowledging that you're a sinner. And so even when Paul showed up in, in Ephesus in, Je in Acts chapter 19, years late, he ran into some believers and, and, and he said, you know, as they began to talk, what baptism are you aware of? And they said, well, we, we, we were baptized of John's baptism. And Paul said to them, John was baptizing with a baptism of repentance, telling the people they should believe on him that was to come, whose name is Jesus Christ. We are told in Luke, I think it's chapter 7, we'll get there eventually, where the people gathered to John's baptism, and, and we read all the people listened to him, even the tax collectors, they justified God being baptized by John, but it was the Pharisees and the lawyers who rejected the will of God for themselves, and they refused to be baptized. They refused to repent. They refused to acknowledge their sin. So here is the ministry of John. You're going to go tell people that they could find salvation with God and the forgiveness of their sin by turning their hearts and their faith to Jesus Christ. That's going to be the call. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, John pointed him out, and he said to his disciples, you better just follow Jesus now, because I have to decrease and he has to increase. But notice in verse 77, salvation is the forgiveness of sins provided through the work of Christ, the one who is coming. You can't work your way into heaven. This was a gift. Turning back to Jesus' work to end, he says in verse 78, through the tender mercies of our God, with which the day, day spring from on high has visited us to give us light to those sitting in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the ways of peace. Salvation by God's mercy, the day spring, it's a word for the rising of the sun, sometimes the, the dawn, Jesus being the light that springs up to those who are sitting in darkness and death and unbelief, to give them the ways of peace. No wonder the angels were so excited to tell the shepherds you know, that the way of peace had come. Things that belong to your peace. When Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem, he said, you know, in this your day, the things that belong to your peace were given to you, but your eyes have been, you've been, they've been hidden from your eyes because of really your unbelief. God wanted to bring peace. God still wants to give people peace. We read in verse 80 that the child, John the Baptist, then grew and became strong in spirit, went out to the desert until the day of his manifestation to Israel. John would spend the next 30 years out of the limelight, being prepared for a very short ministry, really. Paul would spend years out of the limelight when, after he got saved, preparing for the work that God planned for him to do. Moses would spend 40 years out in the Midian wilderness just waiting for the Lord to do something with him. Maybe God's had you out there for a while so that you'd be convinced of who he is. And I, I don't doubt that by the time John the Baptist's ministry began, both of his parents were dead. They were already old to begin with. Now we had 30 more years of their life. So John grew up in the wilderness. His ministry was in the wilderness along the Jordan, down by the Dead Sea. He will begin his ministry in chapter 3, verse 2. And the, he, and he wouldn't have to wait long for the, for the nation to come flocking to him and the and the word was out, the Messiah was coming. But Luke, like I said, he's so he's so diligent in setting the stage so that next week we'll finally at least get to the fact that Jesus is born. And uh, why are we reading all this? Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 4. So that we can have our faith strengthened and we can believe in the Lord. There's a great verse in Psalm 22, verse 21. And it says that I may make known to you the certainty of God's word of truth so that you may answer with a word of truth to those who would be sent to you. In other words, God wants you to be certain of his word. So when you talk to others, you can just with great confidence say, this is what the Lord has said. It's kind of what keeps us going, doesn't it? That's why we're not talking politics from the pulpit. We want you to be sure of the certainty of God's word. Amen. 
Father, thank you this morning for your word to us. And may we, like Zechariah, come to some place in our lives, all of us, where we can be so certain of your word to us. That in those nine months as he sat and he contemplated all that he was facing, all that you had told him, and, and daily having to deal with the consequence of not being able to speak, rejoice with his wife, communicate his emotions. And yet as he dug deep, he, he began to realize that he should have trusted you. That when you speak, it's sure. It is a sure word from the Lord. And everything in this book will be brought to pass. Your promises to us as your people, your provision, your peace, your joy, that, that you always do things well, that you never fail, that nothing fails in your hand, that he who began a good work in, in us will complete it, that no one will be able to snatch us from your hand. May every word, Lord, from your mouth be a certainty in our hearts. And so regardless of what we see around us, we will be moved solely by what you said. Be men and women of the word and the certainty of.